Hi everyone, this video is part two of the cognition unit. And if you remember, cognition just refers to thought processes in the mind. And you can see on the screen, these are the topics that we will be learning about throughout this unit. This particular video will just be covering forgetting, memory distortion, and the biological basis of memory. So to start with, we're gonna start with um, Herman Ebbinghaus and Herman Ebbinghaus's theory of uh, forgetting is something that dates back almost a hundred years. Um, he studied this in the late 1800s and what he was interested in as a cognitive psychologist was memory and he was really interested in the memory loss over time and how much information you actually retain after you first initially learn it. And so he started by um, using just a set of, of syllables. And so he would use like a set of syllables to try to remember, um, just random. So they weren't uh, words with meaning and he, tested himself periodically on his memory of those random syllables um, over time. And what he learned was that as he tested his memory over time, that it continued to decay and decrease. And he actually noticed that the steepest loss of memory happened relatively soon after you initially learned that information. And within the first day, uh, you typically will lose about two thirds of the information that you learned initially. And this was pretty consistent when he tested this, that um, a lot of the information that is initially learned is lost over time. Um, and then it starts to level off. So you can see the curve plotted out there that you can see after the first 20 minutes, how much information was lost even to the first day, how much information was lost after first learning it, and then into a month, um, only about 20% of the information was retained. So uh, that's not great news for those of us who are uh, trying to remember things for tests um, and are, are, <laughs> are preparing to uh, show your information that you've learned in maybe a unit test or at the end of the year. Um, what he did find is that if, um, this process of, of forgetting is followed by periods of relearning that information. So it is inevitable that that information will decay and you will not retain much of it. But if it's followed by periodic intervals of uh, relearning that the curve is less steep over time and that more is retained. And so uh, that's something that I'll get into on, to on the next slide, but the importance of um, practicing that relearning in intervals will actually slow down um, and will actually improve retention over time. So that leads us to what is called the spacing effect. And the spacing effect is just what was mentioned before, that it's the phenomenon that you will have a higher retention of information if you spread out your study periods over a time span rather than just in one session. Um, so the more repeated practice you have of that information, the more likely that information will be retained in the long term. And that doesn't mean like repeating the information uh, 15 times in an hour. That would look like 15 times over two months and then just repeatedly um, coming back to that information. And um, that would be what spacing would be over intervals of spaced out amount of time. So that's what's referred to as the difference between distributed practice versus mass practice. Distributed practice is just like spacing your study or your practicing of information out over time. Mass practice is just like cramming it into one session. The testing effect also is one other piece to this that's really important when it comes to um, to just trying to combat the forgetting curve and trying to remember something long term. The testing effect is the phenomenon that you will have higher retention of information if you do not only like repeated practice, but repeated self testing. So like you're actually practicing recall or memory retrieval. So, um, the testing yourself when you are doing this like spaced out practice would look like um, 
not just reading your notes because that's not actually practicing memory, that's just reading. Uh, the testing effect says that you are more likely to remember the information if you practice recalling it. So there's all different kinds of things you can do to practice recall. Um, note cards where you have a definition and a term on the back forces you, you could look at either side, you could read the definition and force yourself to recall the term. That is actually the, what the testing effect says is the most effective way to retain information. You're actually uh, practicing pulling out the memory so that when you go to pull it out the next time when you need it, it's quicker and easier to retrieve. The serial position effect is a phenomenon that if you are remembering uh, a list of concepts or a list of terms or a list of things and you are trying to remember them, you are likely to remember the things at the beginning of the list and the things at the end of the list um, and forget the things in the middle. So for example, if, if you have someone who asks you to get something from the grocery store and they say, hey, I need you to get bread, milk, eggs, um, butter, flour, cinnamon, and sugar. And you try to remember those things on the way, you are likely going to remember the first couple items on the list and the last couple items, but forget the items in the middle. So you, the primacy effect is oftentimes we remember things at the beginning. Uh, recency is we remember things at the end, but we tend to forget things in the middle. Okay, so on our next slide, we're going to cover factors that are related to forgetting. And some things that impact our ability to remember are interferences. So there are two types of interferences that happen. One is called proactive interference and the other is called retroactive interference. And uh, this is when you have two bits of information in your mind that are kind of related and one is interfering with your ability to remember the other. So proactive interference is when an old memory you have from the past is interfering with your ability to recall a new memory. Um, an example of this is uh, maybe you go up to your locker and you keep putting in your old combination and you're like, what is my new combination? And for whatever reason, it's your old locker combination is all that's coming into your mind. That would be proactive uh, interference. Retroactive interference is when you have new memories that are interfering with your ability to recall something longer ago. Uh, maybe um, you have a situation where you're in class and your teacher asks you to remember something from last semester and all you can think of is what you're learning right now in class. Um, that would be where you're having new information that is interfering with your ability to retrieve old information. And I have an acronym on here uh, to help you remember, PONER. And if you write this down and if you can remember it, it can help you just be able to remember the definitions for these. P would be proactive, so proactive interference. Um, proactive is when old information interferes with new information. Whenever you have new information that's interacting with old information, that's when you have retroactive interference. So that acronym is really helpful for me and just remembering those definitions. Source amnesia is another situation that is related to forgetting. Uh, source amnesia happens all the time. It's whenever people misattribute information to an inaccurate source. Uh, and not that they don't mean to, they just uh, have forgotten where that information comes from. So maybe they're telling you something and they're like, oh yeah, I uh, read that on social media. But really their friend told them. They just misattributed the source. That's source amnesia. Next we have, uh, these are true amnesias. These are things that um, amnesias are any type of memory loss that's not um, caused by an underlying disease. So amnesias could be caused by trauma or stress or um, a brain injury or um, even substances could cause um, amnesias. So there are different types, so a retrograde amnesia, which can be a little bit confusing because we just learned a term that was called retroactive interference, so that could get a little bit confusing for you. But a retrograde amnesia would be where uh, whenever the incident occurred, um, now you are no longer able to retrieve memories from past, from past of that occurrence, from whatever that, that situation was. You can't retrieve old memories. Anterograde amnesia is where uh, whenever that situation occurs, 
now from then on you're no longer able to make new memories and so you can remember old memories but you're not making new memories okay this section is about memory reconstruction so whenever we pull back and we retrieve memories we're actually not pulling back a um like a, a, a video recording of that event we're actually putting pieces back together of that of that event as we are remembering that and so we're really reconstructing the memory as we're pulling it back and elizabeth loftus she is a cognitive psychologist who studied false memories and the misinformation effect she really helped to understand this memory reconstruction when she realized that you could actually introduce a little bit of misleading information to the person when they're recalling it and they will put that piece of misleading information into the memory puzzle as they are reconstructing it as they recall it. So I'll, I'll show you how this works. So she did a study called the misinformation effect and what she did was she had uh, subjects in her experiment witness a car accident. And when those witnesses witnessed the car accident, they were then asked to describe that incident um, afterwards. And when they were asked to describe the incident, what she did was the different people who viewed it, she asked them different questions. And so there were different words in the question that influenced the way that they recalled the memory. So one subject or one group of subjects was asked, how fast were the cars going when they hit each other? And the people who were asked that question, you know, said, oh, they were, you know, they just ran into each other and, you know, it was a minor accident and this is what happened. Then she asked another group of witnesses who witnessed the same incident, rather than asking them how fast were the cars going when they hit each other, she asked how fast were the cars going when they smashed into each other. Just changing that one word influenced the way they remembered the memory of the car accident. And those participants were uh, then described things of the event that weren't actually there. They described first going at higher speeds and also seeing broken glass and debris that actually was not there. But her using the word smashed influenced the way that they, when they were pulling that memory back, the way that they were remembering that event. And so she called this the misinformation effect. And she, she actually recreated this experiment in different ways. Um, she did another study with, um, uh, people who had attended Disneyland. She showed them pictures of like flyers of Disneyland and she had uh, Bugs Bunny on the flyers and she asked them to like, oh, tell me about these flyers. Um, and then she asked them, have you been to Disneyland before? What was it like? Um, what animals have you, you know, the characters did you see there? And um, some of them would report having seen Bugs Bunny. And she influenced that memory or primed them with that memory by showing them pamphlets with Bugs Bunny in it when in actuality Bugs Bunny is a Warner Brothers character and would not have been at Disneyland. Um, and it's not that they, they had no reason to lie, but that just changed the way that they recalled the event um, when she introduced that piece of misleading information. Um, another uh, impact on the way we have false memories is something called the imagination inflation. And this is where when you visualize and imagine something, um, it could actually increase your confidence that that event happened when it actually did not happen. So our next two sections are about the biological basis for memory. So on the screen, you can see the different places that are responsible for memory in the brain. The prefrontal cortex is where short term or working memory is being processed. If you remember, that's the uh, conscious uh, rehearsal of information that only lasts about a minute. And if you know the prefrontal cortex this is where we're having those uh, decisions and problem solving. This is where short term memory is. Hippocampus, this is responsible for explicit long-term memories. The basal ganglia you can see is here and here on this picture. This is responsible for those procedural memories, the implicit memories for motor movements and things you're not necessarily aware that you are um, remembering. Finally, we have LTP, which is long-term potentiation. Um, long-term potentiation, I think uh, you could simplify and just say that this is the, the molecular mechanism behind memory. This is what's going on in your synapses. So um, LTP is 
whenever your synapses are strengthened um, and it's happening in many regions in the hippocampus. So um, this is like the persistent changing of the number and shapes of the synapses when memory is occurring. Um, and so it also involves glutamate as well. And I've got to my...